Morning, everybody. Morning. 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 All right. I ask if you would to turn over to the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at uh, the first two chapters of Hebrews this morning. So Hebrews chapters 1 and 2 is where we're going to be if you want to want to turn over. And as usual, I'm going to be reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. I hope you will follow along. So I've been referencing Hebrews chapter 1 a lot over the last year or two in my lessons. Uh, I think our Christology is formed so richly by the first four verses and what it has to say about Jesus and how we understand who he was and what he came to accomplish based on just this passage alone. But it's part of a bigger thought. And what I want to do this morning is kind of connect the first four verses of Hebrews through the thought that runs throughout the first two chapters. And, and I hope that by doing that, uh, we will, like always, begin to appreciate Jesus just a little more richly. And so if you'd like to follow along with me, Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 1, says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. He's talking about the patriarchs and the prophets that came after them. The way that God informed Israel of who he was through the prophets that he spoke to and through. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by whom? By son, by Jesus. Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And then this is what he says about Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Answering the question, well, where is he now that he's accomplished everything? He's at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much, and I've got it underlined here on the slide, if you look, because I, I, I want you to, to pay attention to a contrast between two statements that the Hebrew writer makes here in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Having become as much superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. There's a very simple point he's trying to make in this first chapter, which is Jesus is superior to the angels. And there's a reason he's making that point, and we'll see what that is in chapter 2. But if we forget about that for just a second and pay attention to these first four verses and what it's saying about Jesus, I, I think we'll see there's some profound statements being made about who Jesus is. Number one, if you think about the way that God has communicated to man and through man in the past, and contrast that to the way that God has communicated to mankind through Jesus, his son, We'll see that what the Hebrew writer is saying here is that God was able to communicate something through Jesus that he was not able to communicate in any other way. It's not that the way that God communicated through the prophets was ineffective. It's that it didn't communicate something specifically that was only able to be communicated through Jesus. And that's why I think he hones in on this statement that I draw our attention to all the time. The reason I reference this passage so much, which is this idea that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact what? Imprint of his nature. In other words, when we see Jesus, who do we really see? God the Father, right? Jesus has come to show us the nature of God. But the key there is that God isn't communicating his nature to us just through ideas and just through words. He's communicating himself to us through another human being. Jesus came to take on flesh, but in taking on flesh, he shows us what the nature of God looks like when wrapped up in humanity. And I guess it would be tempting the first time you read that to think, oh, well, that makes Jesus unique. And it does. That's part of the point he's making here. But it also makes him human. Because to be human is to be the imprint of of the nature of God, right? We've been talking a lot about creation in the garden in our Wednesday night class, and one thing we've been focusing on is that as God is creating mankind, it tells us very clearly he created man and woman in his what? Image, image or as his image, right? We are all, as humanity, supposed to be reflections of the nature of God. We are all imprints of the nature of God, but Jesus came to illustrate to us what that means perfectly and clearly. So instead of just, here's this idea, here's this man. Pay attention to this man, because through this man, he's going to show you what God looks like reflected in and through humanity. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so Jesus is really showing us what humanity can be if we will just embrace what it is we were created to be, right? Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God, and that's what we're called to be as well. And so he's showing us what that looks like in terms that we can perfectly understand. But he's not just the imprint of the nature of God. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So he's not like every other human being, right? He shares in the nature of God in a way that we don't. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's where he is now. He's sitting at the right hand of God, right next to the throne. And here's the point. Having become as much superior to angels, to these messengers, these characters we're going to look at as we continue on in our Wednesday night study, these spiritual beings that, that make up these, this Elohim that we see in Scripture, these other spiritual beings created by God to do something very specific, to communicate God's will to mankind. These angels also had a job, and that job was to tell mankind about what God's will was. The same job that Jesus had, or was given, but Jesus did it in a more superior manner. Jesus is not the same as the angels, and so the Hebrew writer is thinking, okay, to my audience, they're going to hear me tell them that, that Jesus' job on earth was to communicate the will of God to man. And they're going to say, well, so he was just an angel. And the point he's making is, no, he wasn't just an angel. He is much superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. And now he's going to use a whole bunch of Hebrew passages in order to make his point. And one of the things I like about the way the Hebrew writer writes is it, it shows us how the church began to look at everything in the Hebrew scripture through the lens of Jesus, right? And they take passages that maybe we would never consider as being relevant to a discussion of Jesus, and, and it applies to Jesus. So look what he does moving forward. Pick up in verse 5, he says, For to which of the angels did God ever say? Okay, so what is he doing? He's contrasting the way God talked about Jesus to the way he talked about the angels. And he's pulling from Old Testament scripture in order to make that point. So to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my what? Son. Son. And today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and ministers a flame of fire. I've got a job for angels, but my son is superior than the angels because Jesus, or excuse me, God the Father does not reference the angels in the same way that he references the Son. There's a different dynamic. There's a different relationship. And the Hebrew make, writer makes it clear through these scriptures he's referencing. You go on into verse 8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you... So the way the Hebrew writer is understanding this passage is it's a passage talking to and about the Christ. He has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The way that God will anoint the Christ, and by the way, what does the Christ mean? The anointed one. The way that he will anoint the Christ is he will anoint him in a way that makes it clear he is superior. He has no peers. With the oil of gladness beyond your companions, you stand alone as something different and special. That's the point he's making about Jesus in comparison to the angels. And then he goes on in verse 10. And again, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You can only wear your favorite shirt so many times, and you start to get sunburned through it. Ask me how I know. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. The earth is going to wear out. The physical creation will wear out. But you, God, are the same, and your years will have no end. You, the nature of God is different than the nature of his physical creation. It has an end. Right? It has an expiration date associated with it. But God's nature is such that he does not deteriorate. He's not going anywhere. He is eternal. Now, here's the crazy thing. He's referencing the nature of God, but he's applying it to whom? Christ. To Jesus. The angels don't share in that nature of God. The angels are very clearly a part of God's creation. Jesus is not part of God's creation. He is the force behind creation itself. And so Jesus is superior, as the Hebrew writer says, to the angels. <coughs> and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand 
until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. A passage that we know was said in reference to Christ. That's, that's not the job of the angels. That's only Christ. And then this is what he says about angels. So think about the contrast, and this is his summary. Are they not, and he's talking about angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? And we've got this idea, and we'll explore it more in our Wednesday night class. Just the very concept of the salvation that's offered to mankind is not something offered to angels. It's something angels offer to man on behalf of God. Their job is to minister to God's physical creation. So angels have a specific job. Jesus might sound like he's got kind of the same job, but scriptures make it clear Jesus is on a whole different level, right? So he makes this point, but the question is why? Why does the Hebrew writer start off his letter by making the point that Jesus is superior to the angels? Why is that relevant at all? Well, let's get into chapter 2, excuse me. Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Okay, now pay attention to me here for a second. In the beginning, the Hebrew writer introduces us to think about, he's welcoming us to think about the different ways God has communicated himself to mankind. He used to communicate this way, now he communicates through his son. So we need to pay extra special attention to the way God has communicated to us now. We have to pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. For, since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He's referencing the Hebrew Scriptures. He's referencing the Law of Moses, which the Jews understood to have been revealed to them through angels. He says, if what came to us through the revelation of angels was good and right, and true, and we were held accountable to it, and we would be judged based on it, then how much more attention should we pay to a revelation made through God's Son, who I've already showed you is superior to the angels? In other words, if the way God has communicated to us through Jesus is superior to the way that he communicated to us in the past, then we better pay extra special attention to it, right? And that's the point that he's making. That's why it's important for him to contrast Jesus to the angels. He says, it was declared at first by the Lord. Now he's referencing the gospel message, right? The, the, the revelation made through Jesus. It was first declared by the Lord, Jesus. It was attested to us by those who heard. Who's he referencing there? The apostles, right? The authors of the gospel. It was attested to us by those who heard. And I love how John introduces the idea in 1 John, if you remember, right? He talks about the things that we've seen, the things that we've heard, the things with we what? Touched with our hands, right? Think about Thomas in his moment of doubt, right? I'm not going to believe unless I do what? Put my, hands. Put my hands in his wounds, right? And then Jesus appears and invites him to do that very thing, right? The point is Jesus taught us these things, and then they were attested to us by those who witnessed those things. And on top of that, it says, well, God also bore witness. So we've got a witness from Jesus. We've got a witness from those who witnessed Jesus as a witness. And now we've got God as a witness, right? It sounds a lot like uh, in John chapter 5, when Jesus is going through that list of all the reasons to believe in him based on the witnesses, right? God is one of those witnesses. God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. In other words, we've got ample reason to believe in this message because it's been verified in a number of different ways. Jesus said it. His apostles witnessed it. And all the miracles that we've seen worked among us testify on behalf of God that these things are true. Make sense? Okay. So we better pay attention to it. And then he goes on and he says, For it was not to angels, starting at verse 5, that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. So he continues the contrast between Jesus and the angels. Okay. Yes, God used angels to communicate himself to man. But God also used Jesus to communicate himself to man. And the way that God uses Jesus to communicate himself to man is better than the way that he communicated to man through angels. And what's more, God has something different in mind for the ongoing work of the Christ. He says God didn't have in mind that the world would be subjected to angels. When you hear that word subjection, what do you begin to think of? 
Think of authority, right? And who, who stands under authority of, of whom? And God says it was never his intention that the world, humanity, God's creation, should be in subjection to angels, right? Angels, when they appear to man in the story of Scripture, a lot of times scare the dickens out of us, right? We don't know what to do with them. And a lot of times we even try to bow down and do what? Worship, Worship them, and they're very careful to say, no, 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 no. Right? They are among God's creation like we are. There's only one worthy of our worship. We don't bow down in subjection to angels. Angels don't have authority over us. The world is not subject to the authority of angels. That's not the role God created them for. But who does fulfill that role? Christ, Christ Jesus. And so he says, For it was not to angels God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him. Now, it sounds at first like God's just talking about humanity in general, right? Like, why is man significant enough that our creator should pay any attention to him at all? And that's part of the idea here. But there's something in this text that clues us in that he's talking about one man specifically. And what is it? The son of man, right? What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man? Now, when we hear that phrase, immediately our minds go to who? Jesus. Right? Because we know that's associated with Christ. Or son of man that you care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now hold on a second. Hebrew writer uses this passage in reference to Christ to continue his point that he made in chapter 1 that Jesus is what? Superior to the angels. But he does it through a passage that very clearly says that the Son of Man was made what? <clears throat> Lower than the angels. So how is it then that you make the point that Jesus is superior to the angels by proving that he was lower than the angels? Doesn't make any sense, right? Well, what is he talking about? You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. When did that subjection take place? Well, look at what he says. Now, when putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. It's a process that hasn't yet come to full fruition. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of what? Death. The suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for a little while in that, what did he do? He, he left the crown of glory, took on flesh, humbled himself, and died on our behalf. He willingly took on a role in God's plan of salvation that lowered him beyond that role of the angels, right? In other words, he humiliated himself. He took on that humiliation, humbled himself beyond his natural role. And became, if you borrow his turn of phrase, lower than the angels. But there was a purpose to that. That Jesus, through his suffering, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And look what he was. He was crowned with glory and honor because of that suffering. Right As a result of that humbling, as a result of that humiliation, as a result of him willingly taking on the role that made him for a little while lower than the angels, as a result of him willingly taking on death, he ends up becoming crowned with glory and honor. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through what? Suffering. suffering. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. The idea the Hebrew writer is trying to get across here is because of what Jesus came and endured, he is now able to connect with us in a way that we couldn't connect with him before, right? When he took on flesh and did the one thing that all flesh has to do eventually, which is what? Die. Die. He became connected to us in a way where now he can address us as what? Brothers. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Continuing that idea of the connection he has with us. 
Picking up in verse 14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of those same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. God did, or Jesus didn't come and take on flesh to minister to angels. He came and took on flesh to minister to us, God's creation, flesh and blood. And the only way for him to minister to us, flesh and blood, was for him himself to take on flesh and blood. And by taking on flesh and blood, he had the ability then to suffer as flesh and blood does, to give himself in, his, in an act of sacrifice so that he could connect with us in a way that he can call us brothers and understand what it means to be human and therefore serve as this perfect kind of priest on our behalf therefore he has he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people for because he himself has suffered when tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted in other words because of what Jesus came and took on and endured and suffered through, he is able to understand perfectly the things that we take on and suffer and endure. You understand his point? And it answers a big question. Why? Why did God do things the way that God did things? Why on earth was it in God's plan that Jesus would have to take on flesh and suffer on and die on our behalf? And part of the answer to that question is so that he would know what it's like to be us and be able to relate with us in a way that he couldn't otherwise. And that's an amazing thought because we all carry with us a thing. I've got a thing. You've got a thing. My thing might be different than your thing, but they're all things. And we carry those things with us, and those things burden us. Maybe your thing is a health thing. Maybe your thing is a psychological thing. Maybe your thing is a, a family thing. Maybe your thing is a marital thing or a relationship thing. Maybe your thing is a job thing right now. Maybe your thing is a financial thing. Maybe your thing is a great big fat sin thing. But we've all got a thing that we carry around with us. You know who else had a big thing he carried around? Paul. Paul had a thing. He called it the thorn in his flesh, right? And he begged God to take that thing away. I don't want to bear the burden of this thing anymore. Take it away from me. And you remember his response to him? My grace is sufficient for you. Here's the thing about the thing. We've got a thing that's bigger than all the other things. He confused yet? <laughs> right? We have these burdensome things that are just part and parcel for humanity. They're going to manifest themselves different ways in our lives. You never know the way it's going to work itself up in your life, right? And maybe you're experiencing a season in your life right now where your burden is easy and light, right? You don't have anything weighing you down, overwhelming you. But maybe you are. Maybe you are overwhelmed. Maybe you are burdened. Maybe there is a great big thing in your life. Here's the beauty about serving Christ as our Savior. He bore that thing too. And he overcame it. And through that overcoming, he offers us to be partakers with him in his victory over whatever that thing might be in your life. Every human alive has a thing that burdens them. The difference for those of us who find ourselves in Christ is that we are not defined by those things. God doesn't promise that he'll remove that thing from us. He just promises us victory over that thing. We are beaten down, but we are not crushed, Paul says. Being a human still means that you're going to suffer. Being a human still means that you're going to deal with health issues and relationship issues and financial issues and job issues and whatever other issues you can think of. But we are not, as God's victorious people, defined by those 
things. And here's the other beautiful part of it, is that we become part of a brotherhood with Christ as our brother, in which we can carry each other's burdens, right? Bear each other's burdens and so fulfill what? The law of Christ. Jesus himself couldn't carry his thing all the way to the top of the mountain. Remember, they put that cross on him and it was too much for him to bear and they had to get somebody out of the crowd to help him carry it. There's going to come a point in your life and maybe you're there now where your burden is so big you cannot bear it alone. And that's fine. You have help in this assembly of brothers and sisters to help carry that burden with you. The burden might be overwhelming, but it will not defeat you. You will be victorious. And if you need help, ask for it. To contemplate Jesus is a thing I've been doing for, I don't know, 20 plus years now. I mean, there's days where I literally just spend all day contemplating the nature of Jesus. Try to figure out if I got a grasp of it, how am I going to articulate it, right? It's such a deep and beautiful and overwhelming thing. And the Hebrew writer describes it in terms here that are enough to make you emotional if you allow yourself to just dwell on them long enough. We, we serve a God who loved us enough to leave his glory, lower himself beyond that of his own creation so that he could serve his own creation and what's more, die on behalf of his own creation just so that he could better understand that creation and equip him, therefore, to serve his creation even better. That's the God that we serve. And that's awesome. I love that Jesus. I want to share that Jesus with the world because if it weren't for that Jesus, I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing, but it's not good. You ever just get overwhelmed by life? You ever get discouraged? You ever wonder what, what is my real value in these things that I'm doing? What's the point in what I'm getting up early to do today? We all experience those feelings. It's an awesome thing to be able to, in a moment of spiritual clarity, realize that at the end of the day, my Savior has my back. That whatever this burden is I'm bearing under today, he's going to carry it with me. And so I've got a simple invitation for you guys today. As you reflect on this Jesus. This Jesus who was superior to the angels and yet lowered himself a little while beyond that of the angels so that he could better serve his own creation. That Jesus who is victorious on our behalf and invites us into that victory celebration with him. That Jesus is still telling you, like he was last week, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If the burden you are carrying right now is too heavy for you, lay it at the feet of Jesus. And I know that sounds cheap and I know that sounds easy and it sounds like the thing a preacher would say to emotionally manipulate you. And maybe I am a little bit. But what else can we do? What else can we do except ask for help from each other and give it over to our Savior who's been there and done that and already secured the victory for us and say, I need your help carrying this burden right now. If you need that from your Savior this morning, if you need that from your brothers and sisters this morning, then we invite you to let us know about it. Because here's the thing. Sometimes we're all so busy carrying our own burdens that we forget to look at the person next to us and realize that theirs is ten times heavier. And so look around. If, if you feel like your shoulders are strong today and you're willing to carry somebody else's burden, then let us know about that. But if you're overcome by the burden you're carrying, then tell us so that we can help you. What do you need from the church this morning? What do you need from your Savior this morning? What do you need? Let's think about it. Let's sing this next song, and if there's anything we can do to serve you, let us know.